I want to begin with an old joke of mine. I hope you noticed that I joined the applause. And if you know a little bit my work, you know that I use often this example. Uh, why? Because I always distrusted the notion of totalitarianism. I'm not trying to save communism in comparison with fascism, that it's somehow better. I'm just saying that one should be very attentive to the distinctions between the two. What always fascinated me, I'm sorry if some of you know this example of mine, is this. Look at the old documentaries. You find all of them today on YouTube. When a fascist leader, after finishing his speech, receives applause, he just stands and receives the applause. A Stalinist leader always joins the applause. <laughs> it's a totally different subjective position. The message of, and this doesn't make it any better, the message of Stalinist leader is, I'm one of you. It's not really about me. We all serve the cause. You know where you can find this difference also? I was shocked, and this is not, again, communist propaganda. On the contrary, I uh, found this detail in a book very critical of Gulag, simply the title is Gulag and Applebaum. You know that in Gulag, uh, every year on Stalin's birthday, they gathered all the inmates who had to sign a telegram of congratulations to Comrade Stalin, wishing him all the best, and so on and so on. Of course, it was a ridiculous ritual. It was not serious. But the point is, why this ritual? Because just think about it. You cannot even imagine such a ritual in Nazism. To, on Hitler's birthday, to gather all the inmates of Auschwitz and make them sound, sign a congratulation message to Hitler, it's meaningless. Another point, the Stalinist show trials, you know, where the tortured prisoners admit, yes, I collaborated in a plot to overthrow and kill Comrade Stalin. Such a thing doesn't, cannot happen, doesn't have any place in the Nazi or fascist universe. Hitler could have easily done the same. Select some vis visible, uh, important Jewish figures and claim there is a plot again and they, you torture them to confess. It's meaningless. Why? Because, and that's the tragedy, I'm not saying which one is better. Because in Nazism, that's the horror of it, apropos Jews, they are guilty directly for what they are. All you have to prove is that they are Jews. You then have to prove what they plan to do and so on. On the other hand, what makes Stalinism so mysterious almost is that uh, this Stalinist enforced confessions project onto the prisoners a strange duality. You are, and they used all these terrifying terms, the Stalinist, scum of the earth, shit, and so on. But at the same time, they admitted, acknowledged to every accused prisoner the right, as it were, to step on his or her shoulders and objectively pass a judgment on his or her own betrayal. For example, the great Stalinist trials. You have there Bukharin, I, I don't know the big traitors for them. The prosecutor asked them, how did you become an enemy of the people? And as if from a totally objective position, they begin with, already as a young kid, I was educated by my parents to hate the working class and to enjoy exploiting them, whatever. But you see the paradox. You are pure shit, nobody, but at the same time, you still participate in universal reason, reason from where you can see what shit you are. In this sense, Stalinism is much more than fascism, what the Frankfurt School, Adorno and Horkheimer, uh, called dialectic of enlightenment. That is to say, the terrifying, totalitarian, oppressive, however you call it, consequences, implications of enlightenment itself. But I don't want to get lost in all this. The reason I got lost in this little improvisation 
is just to let you know how I like to proceed. Take some small insignificant details. Oh my God, look Stalin's documentary. He stands up and joins the applause. Hitler doesn't. And this is for me the proper Freudian reading through this type of details. And then from this you pass or you see the universal feature at its, at its, in its abstraction, precisely. 